Hey, what's up guys, Aaron here, and welcome back to another episode of my F1 23 My Team Career Mode. This is episode number 10 today for the Austrian Grand Prix in Season 1. If you guys did miss the previous episode at the Canadian GP, then be sure to go check that one out before you see this one, because that was a very, very good episode. And to celebrate, I thought we would get a new livery on the car. I just saw that this came on to the store, and I immediately fell in love with it. I thought, okay, you know what? We're not got any mods in on the game right yet because I like to try and keep it in game for season one. So let's upgrade at least in game to a different livery. And this just spoke to me. Look at those design decals all around the car. We've still got the electric green, but now we've got an injection of whites, greys, blacks, and just different patterns going on. And I think it's a really nice evolution of of what we started off with, with quite a basic electric green livery. And you know, in the past, I've been very critical about Codemasters in-game liveries, the ones you can get on the podium pass. So fair play, more like this, please, because it would actually make me purchase them in the game rather than just always defaulting to PC mods later on down the line after season one is done and over. And along with the new livery, we have some new sponsors on the car. We've actually unlocked the second sponsor slot. So, uh, cause we're a claim level 10. So we've got two new sponsors is on the car. We've got 7 Even and then Equita Oil. I went with 7 Even because the bonus objective uh, was quite manageable and quite high relative to others around them. And also I found it quite nice that their logo and name has 7 in it. Obviously we're number 7 so it just fits the vibe. But yeah it was a very, very good Montreal race day for us at the Canadian Grand Prix. And that made it 8 different winners in the first 9 races. Not quite a single different winner in every single race because uh, quite, you know, uh, under the radar, Leclerc, he's had such a miserable season with three DNFs so far, but he won back-to-back -back races in Melbourne to Baku. But apart from that, all different winners, which is pretty insane. For season one to have eight different winners in nine races is pretty damn awesome. But now we have maybe a more difficult road in terms of upgrading the facilities, upgrading the car, because we're getting to, like I said, major upgrades and also in terms terms of cash, we need to think about where we're spending it now. And because we've got level one everywhere on the facilities, I think the next focus is going to be either a personnel upgrade or a marketing department upgrade. But we also have the added caveat, we need to be wary of the contract period because our teammate is going to cost at least $1 million to re, you know, re-sign for the rest of the season. And it's coming up fast. I think maybe in two episodes time, two races time. So we need to be wary and we might need to delay any purchases until we get the teammate signed, which is also gonna cost 1 million. So we'll lose 1 million there basically compared to our total. So it may take a while to actually finally buy another HQ facility upgrade. And in terms of the car, obviously the car's in a really good spot right now. We got ahead of McLaren and Alpine on the R&D chart. I'm not expecting to stay Stay above them in the next, uh, let's say, five races because I think we're going to slow down on progress. And finally, finally, we may need to delve into durability upgrades because I've not spent anything on them to the point where the first and only upgrade I can buy is a gearbox upgrade, which we are going to finally buy with a pretty heavy discount, to be fair. And that will come in in two races time after the British Grand Prix in time for Hungary. The gearbox really wearing out. We're on our last one. So probably we will have to take some gearbox penalties, which isn't as bad as other components, but that's because I've basically gone with the mantra of, oh, I'd rather have a fast car than a car that just works, but you know, but it just isn't that great. To be fair, the other side of the coin of that is you could be in where Leclerc is with three DNFs, but we've had no DNF so far. So the strategy's worked. Not upgrading durability has worked out for us so far. And on top of that, we do have enough R&D to spend on another chassis upgrade, which is gonna be the uh, next major weight reduction upgrade that will bring our chassis back in line with McLaren and Alpine and you know to that effect I think Austria is going to be maybe a little bit harder than it was at Montreal. Montreal yes there are some fast flowing corners but there was a lot of pace to be found on the back straight on the main straight and the pit straight whereas Austria it is a power circuit but in sector two we may lose out to other cars and find it trickier than we did around Montreal. But because of how Canada went we did beat Esteban Ocon in our rival so we got some extra acclaim there, which was great. And now we're going to pick a new rival, which is going to be Lando Norris. Makes sense out of the ones that we were given because, you know, we've actually 
been on track with Lando quite a couple of times near him and fighting McLaren, of course. We do get the engine upgrade we purchased coming in. That was uh, a while back. I think that was on the, I want to say the ERS. So that's going to maybe allow us to have a little bit more battery to play around with in the races. So we pretty much keep at pace on upgrades with McLaren because you can see they also bring upgrades. Alpine do as well. They brought more upgrades than both us and McLaren. So they jump back ahead and kind of uh, gap pass a little bit. But you can see Haas is pretty close and Alfa Romeo is coming up from the rear to overtake Williams once again and get closer to all of us. So they're a lot closer to Haas and Williams flagging a little bit. And you can see Aston Martin have upgraded to the point where I think they're level pegging with Mercedes. So I did allude to last episode, does Fernando Alonso know something that we don't about his retirement announcement? Because Aston are going from strength to strength ever since he announced that retirement ahead of Montreal. So who knows? Maybe Aston can upgrade their way to fighting for the championship and for Alonso in his final season maybe here in the game fight for the championship by the end I say maybe because obviously we have seen in the past drivers coming out of retirement as well later down the line but not the best start to the race weekend here in Austria with an electrical fault so that saw us lose about three minutes in the session to be fair it was going to happen in any session on the Friday in qualifying, I would have rather it be uh, Q1. I say Friday because, of course, Austria is a sprint race weekend. So we've got qualifying here on the Friday. We've got the sprint race on the Saturday and then the full Grand Prix on the Sunday. Plenty of time to try and find around the Red Bull ring. I felt a little bit rusty off the back of Montreal because I've had a couple of days away from the game. I'm in the middle of moving at the moment. So, yeah, having to do three flying laps in Q1 to extract the lap time out the Red Bull ring but eventually we get up into P8 the car's going well I imagine others will be speeding up there as we go through into Q2 and Q3 but at the start of Q1 it was a little bit wobbly I was like okay where's the pace gone is this really a drastic difference in circuit but like I said Austria is a bit of a power circuit so that engine power that we have having the best engine on the grid still is going to come in handy especially in the race conditions I think with DRS trying to go for overtakes, that's going to be very useful. But I can definitely also tell in Sector 2, we are losing a chunk of time compared to even, you know, Alfa Romeo, for example. But also the cars around us of Alpine, McLaren, Haas, of course, as well. But we're making up for it on the straights in Sector 1 and in Sector 3 as we come down the hill. Q2, much better time for us, I guess, in terms of on the pace straight away. It, you know, near the top 10. We had a second flying lap just to get us through. I mean, it's such fine margins. Myself and Lando Norris on the same uh, 10th percentile, uh, you know, in P9 and P10 there. Gasly only a couple of thousands ahead of us. And initially, I actually set the same lap time as Pierre Gasly on the first run. So as ever, the Red Bull ring being such a short circuit, you are really bunched up together. Uh, but you can see in the top, it's got a bit of a mixture. You've got Leclerc up there for Ferrari. For Alonso is looking quicker in Q1, so he's floating about there in P5. But Q3 was set to be a complete spanner in the works. You can see the rain is falling around Austria. We're on the soft compound. It is dry enough to set a time, but you can see I'm slipping and sliding a little bit. And I've alluded to this before. I think on this game, more so than last year's game, I think the AI are really overpowered in these conditions where it's a bit damp. You know, you've seen it in the race conditions where they decide to pit really early when it's visually so much wetter than you think it is. And it also translates to their pace. I think they're so good in these kind of conditions. So we go across the line for P7 at the moment. But by the end of the session, I pretty much had to accept that I was never going to go better than that because, yeah, they're just so, so good in those conditions. So Verstappen, though, takes pole position crucially at Red Bull's home race here at the Red Bull ring ahead of Leclerc on the front row Alonso up there in P4 beating both Mercedes so those Aston Martin upgrades have come in and worked for them for us obviously just designated to P10 didn't think we had much better to do basically because I was feeling the damp track the AI clearly weren't so we're just gonna have to make up for it on the sprint to set the grid for Sunday's race but also of course some points are available on Saturday here to try and help us out in the championship as well and so we're going to get straight into it then as we go to five red lights for this sprint race here at the red bull ring lights out 
out and away we go. Norris with a woeful start on the left-hand side of the grid. Perez on the inside. We get boxed in a little because I wanted to go to the outside to try and get this move done on Gasly. We're going to be side by side with the Frenchman in the Alpine. No slipstream from the cars ahead. They're all moving to the right-hand side. We're still there on the left looking to maybe make the dive on Gasly and Perez both as well as Gasly hits us on the inside. Gasly spun us and he's broken our floor and there's a red flag. There's a red flag on lap one of the sprint. That is ridiculous. And Gasly, I don't know what was going on. I thought I gave him enough room, to be honest, but maybe he just got squeezed in. But I was adamant of making the move on Perez. Gasly was still obviously there. I thought I was giving him room. He didn't really bother to try and make the corner. He just cut across the curve, very similar to Hamilton in Monaco, and just decided to go into my side uh, impact structure of the car. And this is probably why the red flag got called out because there were cars reversing. There's an Alfa Romeo driving into the gravel trap to go around the outside. So no wonder there is a red flag there, but just surprised it instantly happened on lap one. And uh, so we're going to switch to the soft compound attire because this is, this is the time to change our strategy around and try something because we've only now got, uh, what's that, nine laps to go of this sprint. This time we don't jump this star like we did in Miami when there was a red flag we get a great start on Russell who bogs down maybe caught him sleeping a little bit but we do have that major major floor damage orange on the heads up display that's not great that's going to affect us in the corners but in a straight line we've still got that pace Piastri maybe going for a move we go defensive to the inside to my surprise the McLarens are flying high here both Norris and Piastri, and Piastri actually completely gets Russell, and you know, to be fair, Piastri also chose to go onto the soft compound attire, so maybe showing this was the better way to go off the red flag. Remember, unfortunately, at the moment on this game, we do know, annoyingly, that the red flag coming out means, no matter what happens in this sprint race, um, the position we started the red flag in is going to be the position we finish in. It's pretty. It's a pretty game-breaking bug. I hope there is a patch on the way sooner rather than later. But right now, that's the stick of it. So I guess we're kind of just driving for a little bit of pride and just to kind of see what the pace of the car is, I guess, with this amount of damage and seeing what we can do. Lando down the inside of Hamilton. We're going to try and thread it through. We tried. We tried our best, but we're going to have to go to the left-hand side instead of Hamilton, who's going slow here on lap four. He's on the inside. Lando on the outside. Oh! Hamilton's come across and he's crashed into the McLaren. Hamilton with a penalty. Lando Norris is out of the sprint race. That was an absolute disaster for the Mercedes man. He's going slow. He's definitely got some sort of issue in the car because even Lando was having a go at him. But we backed out of that because I could see the writing on the wall. And whoa, big, big impact for Lando Norris on the outside there. He literally vaulted Hamilton's car into the air. So Lando's out. That's good for us because even though the red flag will reset the positions, I'm pretty sure it would still count Lando as a DNF. That's the only thing that's not affected by this red flag glitch. So remember, Lando not only is in the McLaren, who's our rival team in the championship, Lando's our in-game rival right now. So for, to get that claim, that's really good news for us that he's DNF'd in this race. He's going to start from towards the back of Sunday's grid. But yeah, Hamilton with an issue on his car because he's really slow. He's holding up all the cars behind us by 1.2 to 1.7 seconds. As we see Fernando Alonso ahead of us in P4 trying to make some moves on Max Verstappen. It's a real shame this won't count for tomorrow's race on the grid and by the end of this sprint race because this would mean Fernando might start on the second row and ahead of Verstappen as he goes round the outside of the Dutchman Red Bull. I mean, Verstappen, remember, was on pole for this sprint race. So he's not only lost pole, he's now down to P4. It's a 1-2 for Scuderia Ferrari. Carlos Sainz, the championship leader, is the one that leads the sprint race. Leclerc in second. Alonso now up in third. Verstappen down to P4. That's not what you want. That's why Sainz is leading the championship. Doesn't matter how quick that Red Bull is in a straight line over one lap. 
operationally, they've not been great. Something's going on with them in the race pace terms because, yeah, the snap and down to P4 is not what you want to see if you're Christian Horner on the pit walls. We now cut to lap 10, and Russell has finally got past Lewis Hamilton, and he's flown by us, and I've not bothered to fight it. One, because I know the position won't matter for anything, but also two, he's in a much quicker car. The only reason I got Hamilton was he clearly had an issue with his machine as Perez now flies by us. It's the last lap of the race though, so I am going to fight Perez a bit because it's the last lap, so you may as well go for it if it's the last lap. Bit of a different situation when you're in the middle of the race, but also to be fair, Perez just hasn't been very quick in this uh, save of ours, in this career mode of ours so far, so I know we can maybe have a go at him. Even with a broken floor, he's, n he's just really been that poor on this game so far that we have a go. We've got the DRS. We know we're quicker in a straight line with the DRS and back but Perez is defined to defend us. We try and switch it back to the inside. You can see a little few little twitches here. And mid corner, the red ball has the pace over us. Not only because it's a red ball, but obviously because of the broken floor. But Hamilton, he's well, he's not even behind us. He's behind Stroll now. 2.7 the gap is. So absolutely, there's some sort of issue uh, with that second Mercedes that he's fallen back so much, which is you know, made it a good thing that we obviously got past him, but in the end, it's not going to matter for too much as Carlos Sainz comes through to win the sprint race. I should say this alternate version of the game, but to be fair, he actually started the red flag in first, so kind of nice for him and for the championship's sake that he does actually get the race win. But I come home, instead of where we were, I come home in P8, so we get one point for the sprint race and we start in P8. Are on the grid for Sunday's race. But like I said, Lando's DNF will count. So he's down there in last place. But the likes of Hamilton jump back ahead of us in P7 then for tomorrow's full Grand Prix. Let's get at it. P8, and then we can do some work from here. Good afternoon and welcome to Spielberg and to a circuit that in one form or another has held every Austrian Grand Prix in the championship except the very first back in 1964. It was at this race that John Watson lost a bet and his beard when he took Team Penske's only F1 victory in 1976. If anything, the stakes are even higher today with 25 points available for victory and a crucial advantage in the championship fight. It's one of the shortest laps on the calendar today then with seven Seven rights and just three lefts, making up the ten corners of this high-speed circuit. Turn two is barely a corner at all. They'll be flat out through there. A left-hand kink into the uphill braking zone of turn three. Turns one, three and four are all potential opportunities to overtake. It's time to take a look at our starting grid for today's race. An immense lap from Carlos Sainz yesterday puts him in pole position with Charles Leclerc alongside. Moving on to the rest of the grid, we have... Verstappen, Fernando Alonso, Russell, Perez, Hamilton, the owner driver, Stroll, Gasly, Sonoda, Joe, Bottas, Oscar Piastri, Ocon, Hulkenberg, Albon, De Vries, Iwasa, Sargent, Norris, Sargent. Now it's almost time for lights out, so let's go down to the track. Anthony Davidson joins me once again in the commentary box, and it's fantastic to have you with us here, but I'm curious, as a man with experience out on the track, how do you stop those pre-race nerves from becoming overwhelming when you're lining up on the grid? Well, I imagine they'll be starting to feel the adrenaline as they anticipate the rundown into Turn 1, a bit like preparing to go into battle. The unknown situation will bring nerves, but that's a good thing. It will keep them focused on the moment and on their surroundings as we build towards the start of the Grand Prix. So we know there is definitely some pace in this car around this circuit because even with the broken floor, we weren't too bad. I know Russell flew by us, Perez did get us a fair and square as well, but I could tell that we could maybe have fought Russell a bit more maybe and Perez as well if the floor was okay. So I think there's some chance here 
obviously just depends on where we end up after lap one in terms of track position. You know, if we stay here in P8, we're basically best of the rest, really, because the cars ahead of us are all either Ferrari, Red Bull, Mercedes, or Aston Martin, apart from Stroll. So like Albon is alluded to in real life, it's really tough when you've got four teams performing well like that, because best of the rest is just P9, basically, because they take up the top eight positions. So we could be fighting for some very small points today, or if there's a bit of chaos, maybe like there was in the sprint race, it could definitely be more. I'm hoping for the latter as we go to five red lights to the full Austrian Grand Prix. We're underway, and it's a bit of a shaky start for a couple of people. Alonso a bit slow. He's going to hold up Russell into turn one, and that allows Hamilton to go round the outside for a double overtake on his teammate and Sergio Perez. We took it very delicately into turn one. Just don't want to get our nose in. We've got a long race ahead of us. 36 laps around the Red Bull ring, and let's not get some damage like we did in the sprint race. So we go around the outside of this right-hander, trying to avoid action. Hamilton nearly causes us disaster there because uh, we had to kind of slow ourselves up because he kind of brake checked us whilst fighting Russell. But we are now on the outside of Sergio Perez. We're going to try and dive this, but we get far too close to George Russell's rear end. And in the end of it, Perez stays calm and collected and keeps the P7. Maybe as we go down the inside, we get a wash of on this dear heavy fuel car. Little bit of a love tap uh, to Sergio Perez and uh, thankfully no damage, but Perez does get us and he does start to pull away on lap two. He's already a second ahead of us now in that clean air as Iwasa is going to be out of the Grand Prix. No crash for him this time like in Montreal. That's just a, an engine failure, where, which to be fair is maybe a bit concerning. It's the first engine failure either of us have had in this entire season. So I hope those engine gremlins stay away. Obviously, we've had our fair share of issues of ERS and fuel issues, but we've not had a full-blown DNF just yet as we watch Perez overtake Hamilton, get the elbows out. And if it, is it just me? Hamilton looks a little bit sheepish there. I think he still might have a bit of a limping car from Saturday's sprint as Stroll flies by us and we don't put up much of a fight because I could tell the way he caught up to us that I think the Aston actually has some genuine pace. So I'm going to stick behind him on purpose, lifting off, just kind of almost bump drafting him because I want basically to follow, I want to try and follow him through when he overtakes Hamilton. Not if, when, because yeah, Lewis definitely has some sort of car issue still going on from Saturday's sprint as Stroll makes easy work of him up to P7. Alonso's still up in P4, so clearly the Aston Martin actually has some decent pace today. Verstappen has managed to get into first place. We haven't seen the overtakes, but he's overtaken both Ferraris to get into P1 of this race to try and make up for the disaster that was his sprint race on the Saturday. And now that Stroll's got past Hamilton, I'm hoping we can as well. The plan didn't exactly work in terms of following him through because Stroll was so quick, he just rapidly overtook Hamilton in a very unorthodox place that I didn't think he was going to. So instead, we just get our own DRS overtake, maybe hopefully done on Hamilton, going into this right-hander where he had an absolute nightmare on uh, the, in the sprint race, crashing out the McLaren. We squeeze him out and give Hamilton a bit of a, a taste of his own medicine from uh, that exact corner. You know, obviously he's had some, in, you know, some altercations with Red Bulls in the past at that very corner uh, to the point where now Ocon has got through up into P9. Behind you've got Sonoda leading a train in P11. So Sonoda once again carrying that Alpha Tauri into places where it just shouldn't be because Defries is all they down in P20. Uh, Sonoda knocking on the door of some points maybe, especially if Hamilton is just going to keep on being slow in this race. But uh, the Alpine surprises me with a lot of straight line speed there with DRS. You can see I did deploy a fair amount of battery. I've got single digits though, so there's not a lot to play around with. But we have to try and re-overtake Ocon now. But maybe there's more of a fight on our hands than we thought initially with the Alpine. You've also got Hamilton who's sticking in there with DRS for now. But um, I, I don't know. I, maybe he'll speed up. I, I really don't know what's going on with this car as we switch it from left to right on Ocon. You know, for Hamilton, it may just be a temporary mechanical issue. You know, we, we know that's a thing in the game as we overtake Ocon once again, get across to the racing line. But that Alpine and the Mercedes just keep sticking with us annoyingly. Strolls walked off in the distance by about nearly three and a half seconds now as Hamilton is the one that now gets us because he overtook Ocon and maybe now his car is fine as he's made two overtakes to get back to P8 
in a sequence of like a lap and a bit now, but we're going to have DRS back on our fellow compatriot. You, we're really using the battery here, and it's actually now stuck on overtake mode. I didn't realize this at the time, but it's stuck on overtake mode. That's why the heads up display has come up on the right hand side, and you can see on the bottom right, it's just deploying all the time. I didn't realize. I thought I was clicking it and unclicking it to deploy and not deploy. And the reason why that matters is one, it's draining my battery, and two, I'm pretty damn lucky I haven't put the rear tire on a, you know, very 3D curb whilst that extra torque is coming in. Is now Ocon overtakes us very, very fine as we cut in underneath his rear wing. Thankfully, the ERS has now sorted itself out. I can now manage it once again, but we have to go and overtake the Frenchman once more for the third time now as Ocon goes defensive into turn one. We're going to swoop through for the tighter line and a better exit. We're all almost level with him on the exit there. We're going to power pass with DRS, but Hamilton is lurking in the background and he's gone for it. We're going to back out of it. Hamilton cuts the curb and he's made contact again with another car. He's crashed into Ocon. On safety car is out, and uh, what? I think I just got a five second penalty with that. I did. Hamilton's out of the race somehow. Oh, he had front wing damage, but that was enough to get him out of the Grand Prix. But I've been given a penalty for contact with Hamilton. How is that? FIA, explain how that works because Hamilton absolutely sends it. I back out of it. He cuts the curb, crashes into the Alpine, breaks his own front wing. There was minimal contact with me and Hamilton. And if anything, he crashed into me because I was just trying to get out of his way as he had that crash with Ocon. He parks up, which is a little bit of karma, I guess, for him of being out of the race. Somehow giving me a penalty, though, that I have to now uh, take because we've got a safety car and I may as well pit. We've got a couple of other people in the pit lane and I'm going to put on a set of hard tyres but you can see I um well I was too seething in the cockpit about the penalty that I didn't realise where the turn in was I kind of looked up and went oh god and I missed it so we've got a late pit stop uh, on the turn in five seconds added on so not great we've come out in P80 80, 80. We were fighting for some good points, and now we're uh, 15th in this race by the time the safety car comes in, because a few others have made pit stops up to P14 now, actually, in fact, because Piastri came in as the safety car came in, so some very odd strategy plays from McLaren there. Also, a couple, of, a, lot, a lot of people actually didn't bother to make a pit stop under that safety car, as we now send it on Gasly to try and catch him napping, but that may come back to pay us dividends. We've got a free pit stop, Onto hards. Yes, we had the penalty to deal with, but now we're on a set of hard tyres that can go all the way to the end of the race. I know a lot of people are on soft, so they're going to have to at least make minimum one more stop in this race. So we're going to jump up a load of positions. So right now, it does look a bit doom and gloom, you know, you know, starting that safety car up here down in P15. But we're already up to 13th place. There's a couple of cars here we could definitely overtake just on pure pace, even, even though we're on hard tyres versus their softs. But there's also a load of people that have to come in. That They have to, either just to change the compound for the ruling or because they can't get to the end as we try and find our way past the Alfa Romeo of Bottas trying to follow through Alexander Albon. He was getting a bit frosty there with those four cars ahead of us. We try and go on the left-hand side of De Vries, but he's adamantly staying on the racing line there. It was a bit cheeky for me, to be fair, to think that I could go on the outside. But in the end, we get De Vries on the inside. A little love tap. I check for damage and ask my engineer. Thankfully, there is no damage with that little love tap. And now we can get on about overtaking Alexander Albon to get up into a points paying position once more. And ahead of us, you know, Joe, he's on softs. I think the Alpine ahead of him and Sergeant, they're on softs as well. So all these people, they'll have to make a pit stop anyway, let alone me overtaking them as is, as we go round the outside with Al Bono and he's on the soft. So he does have a lot of performance. And this is what I'm talking about. Albon in the worst car on the grid gives me a proper fight through these corners. And that's the same advantage I used in Catalonia, even at Montreal 
on medium tyres to hard because in this year's game, it really is very apparent that the compound differences make a big, big impact on grip, especially at the start of stints. As we now focus on the front fight and Leclerc leads this race for Stappen down to third because Perez is in the middle of overtaking him. What is going on here? Alonso now right up there, Chuff. Even Stroll's up there. The Aston Martins could both have a go at the two Red Bulls. Russell in there as well. So this fight is getting pretty damn tasty. And meanwhile, Leclerc is walking away with this two seconds up the road now as Fernando Alonso goes round the outside of Sergio Perez. Verstappen got the elbows out to re-overtake his teammate. But Leclerc's loving life, 2.3 seconds in the lead. And to be honest, he deserves a race like this where he can maybe walk away with the win because you know, he's had three DNFs in four races. It's not been a great run for him. But yeah, I'm looking at the tyre compounds. A few of these guys are on softs like Russell. Ocon's on mediums. We know Joe and Sargent, I think, are both on softs. Um, I couldn't quite catch what Leclerc was on. I think he may have been on a set of hard tyres himself along with Verstappen. So I don't know if they're going to make another pit stop or not. But either way, there are definitely a couple of positions there for the taking as we overtake Logan Sargent to get both the Williams cars to get up into P9. So yeah, Joe is on softs because he actually is having a go at Ocon. Uh, he's back down to now P6 as we climb up to P7. So a couple of cars have already got out of our way, including Russell. Uh, but at the front, Leclerc still leads. Perez second, Alonso third. So Verstappen has actually pit now. And oh, Stroll. Stroll is going for it. He was trying to make a move on Fernando, but Ocon awkwardly uh, parked his car there. And they're fighting so much that we've caught up to them. Joe has gone for the move. The Alfa Romeo is looking to get up into P4 now. Go on, son. Round the outside of Lance Stroll. We try and go around the outside of Ocon, who doesn't know we're there, I think. So he nearly gave us the full-on Verstappen squeeze to the left-hand side. But thankfully, he didn't. We got the room, DRS, and we get up into P6 now. And going to catch Stroll napping. Absolutely. He was just too busy, maybe getting a bit frustrated by losing positions rather than gaining on Fernando Alonso. And it's an easy overtake for us. And we're now watching Joe Guan Yu go for P3 in this race. I know he has to make a pit stop, but that's still unbelievable for him in the Alfa Romeo to be battling for P3 right now. Two thirds of the way into this race as we just kind of have to wait here and see what's going to go on because I couldn't make a move to the inside because Joe was blocking the line. Alonso on the racing line. The two of them are side by side. We're just watching this battle in front of us with a two-time world champion and a man who's only had in his second season in Formula 1 but doing so well. But we're going to spoil the party. Get down the inside. It's going to be very close on the exit. We give Joe all the room in the world. But the Alfa Romeo is coming back at us. I don't want to overuse my battery. So we let him through at turn one and try and recompose ourselves for the re-overtake. And we get the tighter exit off turn one to re-overtake up into third place right now. And remember, we're not pitting. We're not pitting again. Perez is in first. Alonso second. They're on hards. They're not pitting. Leclerc's obviously pit. So Leclerc and Verstappen both made a second pit stop then. I don't know if they pit under the safety car or not. But either way, they're behind us at the moment. So maybe not for too long, because even though Leclerc has pit onto a set of hard tyres, they're much, much fresher. So many laps new, and he flies by us. And I know there's no point fighting him, because he was leading the race. I think he will be winning the race, because he's going to overtake Alonso here, and then probably go on to chase after Sergio Perez. He's got some blinding pace on those new hards, so there is no point fighting him. Unlike in Montreal, I know he's not in our fight. We don't have the pace to keep him behind, but we do have the pace to maybe overtake Fernando Alonso with aid of Leclerc, because he got the elbow up so much that he really upset Alonso. But Leclerc's parked this so awkwardly for us. I had a half-hearted look to the inside, but ultimately I thought there's no point diving it there, but we have a bit of a tank slapper and look behind us, and Stroll is just round the corner as well as Max Verstappen as we go for the move now on Alonso who's looking a little bit vulnerable now maybe he's got some tyre wear issues as we go round the outside of the Spaniard Stroll tries to follow us through to overtake his teammate 
Stroll's having a really good race here compared to his season so far in this game as Verstappen is now coming through. He'll be looking to slice past all of us because he was obviously in like a net P2 with Leclerc having made that extra stop and eventually on lap 27 Verstappen is going to come knocking. He's overtaken Stroll. Stroll and Alonso are too busy fighting each other. Verstappen flies by again not putting up too much of a fight because Leclerc has already overtaken Perez now. He's in the lead once again and I imagine Verstappen will catch Perez and get into second place. They're, they're just not in our fight. Who is in our fight, though, are those two Astins, which is really good because Aston Martin are ahead of us in terms of pure R&D on paper. But we're having a really good race, and Alonso is struggling because Stroll keeps on trying to overtake him. And by lap 31, Stroll has actually overtaken him and gapped him. He's two seconds clear of Alonso. As we cut to Charles Leclerc, who's gone over the bumps on the runoff area. He's off circuit. He comes back on, but he's looking a bit slow, and he's parking up. Oh, no. Oh, no. Leclerc. Charles. It's a fourth DNF in five races and this one's the worst one of them all he was dominating this grand prix he had like seconds upon seconds on verstappen and now all of a sudden it's a one two for the red bulls at the red bull ring it's meant to be for them and just not in the stars for charles leclerc this season even when he's winning he can't win this is unbelievable so we're up into third place now uh, as we watch his teammates science down in P11, he, I mean, they've had a nightmare with Carlos Sainz's strategy to, to, to the point where he's down in P11. Why did they not just put Sainz and Leclerc on the same strategy? I'll never know. But yeah, Sainz is now having to fight his way back into some points, paying positions. As now on lap 33, Stroll overtakes us. I said, I said he's looking good. You know, he gapped Alonso by two seconds. So this is maybe Lance Stroll's day for Aston Martin, but can we try and get P3 back? It's starting to rain now here in Austria. The rains come back as we have a double lockup as we try to overtake Stroll. We go completely off circuit and get it all crossed up. We're on the grass having to drift the car back onto circuit and we have to lick our wounds and continue on down in P4. It, it's Stroll's day. He, he, he's got that P3. I wanted to try and get it back and look at Fernando Alonso losing the position to Sonoda. What a move by the way by Yuki down the inside there. Great dive bomb. Sonoda is in P5 in that horrendous Alpha Tauri. That might be the drive of the day, to be honest. Forget Stroll, forget Leclerc's engine. That might be the most interesting thing in the whole day. Sonoda in P5 in the Alpha Tauri. And by the last lap of the Grand Prix, it's fully raining now. And if, the, if there was a couple of more laps in this race, it would go to Inters. But it's the last lap of the Grand Prix. Stroll, by the way, not only overtook me, he's gone and chased Perez and got P2. So fair play. I, I can't be annoyed about Stroll overtaking me and getting me because he has so much pace in the tank that he's now got up to second place as we fight Sonoda for P4 because that's how overpowered the AI are in these damn conditions. But Max Verstappen wins this Austrian Grand Prix. Lance Stroll, take a bow. He's beaten his teammate Fernando Alonso and he's gone and got second place. Not just the third place from me. He's gone and caught Perez and got second place 18 points for himself fair play we come home we limp home in p4 and uh Sonoda gets p5 what an unbelievable race in terms of results and how that's gone Leclerc uh someone check on him that man needs antidepressants ASAP because wow what a horrendous season he's having a fantastic team effort then to secure victory here in the Styrian Alps tell me out how do they manage to achieve this win Red Bull put up an outstanding fight for the front position today and it's great to see it paid off for them. They do so much for the sports that you can't help but be delighted by today's race It's win. a big day in the office for Max Verstappen winning this one because with Carlos Sainz down the order, I think he only finished in P9, was it? That's a big 25 points compared to Sainz's two. That might be a big enough of a swing of points to maybe get Verstappen back into the lead of this championship. And it's game on for the championship. Because before this race, Sainz had like over 20 points 
to second place. He was looking pretty damn good, surprisingly, for the championship in terms of controlling it, being consistent. But yeah, he only got two points. Verstappen got 26 because he got the fast half of the Grand Prix and he got six points for obviously the sprint. Uh, Science winning that one. So that kind of, you know, does d limit the damage a little bit for him. But um, what a race. Verstappen gets the win after Leclerc DNFs from the lead. Stroll, what an unbelievable drive to get second place. Chase after Perez and get him on the last lap. Sonoda with that unreal overtake on Alonso and he gets a top five finish. And Joe Guan Yu finishes ahead of Sainz in the Alfa Romeo. And it means, yeah, Verstappen now leads the championship by four points. So it's game on. And it looks like it's going to be the two old Toro Rosso teammates. Verstappen versus Sainz for the championship, maybe. Obviously, I know we're still not even to halfway point of the season. But you got to say, they look like the most consistent men if you kind of ignore Sainz's strategy blunder today. And Red Bull now take the lead of the constructors. What a nightmare weekend for Ferrari. They were 1-2 in the sprint and it's all unfolded uh, for, for them. And it's great stuff for Red Bull. Aston Martin... With Stroll's pace, that was a bit worrisome. So I think all the dreams of maybe really going after Aston Martin are shot with that one. Because I think if Stroll and Alonso are performing like Stroll did today, yeah, we need to stay in our corner. We're fighting this man, Lando Norris. And we're st just basically our goal is just to try and keep ahead of McLaren and Alpine. But what a hectic... Austrian Grand Prix with the sprint as well with red flags. So much happened in this episode. Guys, if you have enjoyed it, be sure to hit that like button. Let me know what you thought in the comments below. When you're around here, then do get subscribed for weekly Formula 1 content, and I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.